Hello everyone, my name is Dustin Schwab and I'm a career development specialist here at Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, which we refer to as OOD. Today I am co-hosting with my colleague Julie Wood and we'd like to welcome you to the Employer's Reasonable Accommodation Handbook six-part webinar series for the second session titled Physical Disabilities. Julie, can you please introduce yourself? Sure, thank you Dustin and hello everyone. My name is Julie Wood and I am OOD's Worksite Accessibility Specialist. I am also an occupational therapist and a certified ADA coordinator. My main role at the agency is to provide education for employers on creating inclusive and accessible workplaces, which includes talking about the guidelines under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA, identifying ideas to consider for reasonable accommodations, and certainly sharing best practices and guidance for making the workplace accessible. Thank you, Julie. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that today's training comes with a learner's guide and a helpful fact sheet, which can be accessed now through the link that is posted in the Q&A section here in Microsoft Teams. Just as a reminder, the information that we share in these resources and during today's conversation is for educational purposes only and is not legal advice but we do hope this information is helpful for you. We'll be stopping about halfway through today's presentation and then again before we conclude to answer questions. So please post your questions in the Q&A section at any time throughout the presentation so that they're ready for us when we stop. Julie, would you like to address the accessibility practices that we have included in today's webinar? Absolutely. As we create our training materials, we plan for accessibility from the start. For example, we use the accessibility checker that is built into Microsoft 365 to review the accessibility of the learner's guide, fact sheet, and PowerPoint. We pay attention to color contrast, font size, and we make sure to add alternative text to visual images in these materials. Also, in our delivery today, you will notice that Dustin and I mention each other by name as the conversation between us goes back and forth. We do this intentionally so the audience is aware of who is speaking. This can be helpful when attendees are receiving this information through services like American Sign Language Interpretation and live captioning. After the webinar, we edit the transcript and fix any captioning errors before archiving the webinar in our on-demand library. We have found that taking these intentional steps up front can make this presentation more accessible and inclusive for everyone. Thank you, Julie. So today's webinar is about physical disabilities. Can you provide a brief overview of the topics that we will discuss? Dustin, we will describe what physical disabilities are. We'll talk about ways to create a disability inclusive culture by sharing some disability etiquette and awareness tips. And then we will discuss what is unique about providing reasonable accommodations specific to physical disabilities and then share some examples. Sounds good, Julie. So as we mentioned last month, throughout the Employer's Reasonable Accommodation Handbook series, we are going to share stories of OOD participants who have successfully found employment. Our first story today is about Connor and was featured in an OOD Works newsletter on July 8th, 2022. Connor has cerebral palsy. He graduated from Bowling Green State University with a degree in public relations. While in school, Connor did an internship with the Lucas County Board of Developmental Disabilities. In his internship, he developed a podcast called Disability and Beyond. Connor oversaw the production elements of the podcast, including editing and interviewing. Dustin, Connor said the podcast increased his overall verbal skills and interviewing skills, and he learned how to respond positively to constructive criticism from others. So Julie, since we create a webinar each month, we also get helpful feedback from our supervisors and coworkers on the content that we include. That's why I thought it would be fun to start with Connor's story since his internship involved work very similar to the work that we are doing today. Like we mentioned, Connor has cerebral palsy, and if you joined us last month, you may remember hearing another story about a job seeker with cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy can include an intellectual disability, a physical disability, or both. Julie, since we are focusing on physical disabilities today, can you tell us about these? 
Sure, so physical disabilities can impact the systems of the body and the physical functioning of the body. A person can acquire a physical disability in a variety of ways. One way is through a congenital condition, which means the condition occurs at or before birth. Another way is from a developmental condition or another medical condition. And a physical disability can be a result of an injury, an accident, or the aging process. Physical disabilities can also be temporary, chronic, and include periods of exacerbations or flare-ups. Julie, what are some medical conditions that can lead to physical disabilities? Some common examples are conditions like arthritis, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, amputations, and musculoskeletal injuries. Julie, despite the name of the condition or how it was acquired, What's most helpful for employers is to understand how a physical disability impacts an individual relevant to the workplace. So can you explain some of the physical functions and limitations an individual with a physical disability may experience? Sure, Dustin. One way to categorize physical function is by type of motor function, which can be further categorized as gross motor skills, fine motor skills, and other motor functions. The Job Accommodation Network, known as JAN, has a helpful resource on their website which describes these. For example, gross motor skills include more of the large muscles of the arms, legs, and the torso, and are used to perform many activities like walking, sitting, and standing, pushing and pulling, bending and reaching, carrying, needling and squatting, and foot control. Fine motor skills are manual dexterity functions that use the smaller muscles of the hand for activities like grasping, handling, use of fingers, and feeling or sensing. And then everything else is categorized as other motor functions. And this includes body size, stamina, fatigue, coordination, strength and weakness, reaction time, spasms, tremors, use of one hand or one arm, and use of one side of the body. Now, these examples show the many ways a physical disability can impact a person. However, while an individual may experience some of these, it would be rare to experience all of them, and the degree to which a person is impacted varies. And just like all people, people with physical disabilities have unique abilities, strengths, and skills. So Dustin, how a person may be impacted in the workplace will be unique. That makes sense. Okay, how about another story, which this one is about Michael and was shared in the OOD Works newsletter on June 17th, 2022. Michael has a physical disability that was caused by a degenerative joint disease. During an OOD hiring event, Michael interviewed with Hyatt Regency in Cincinnati. Shortly after that, he was hired as an internal hotel operator. It's a customer service role that allows him to work in a stationary position. Dustin, Michael says that he finds out what the caller needs and provides exemplary customer service. As far as his role goes, Michael, who is 64, said, I'm not retiring yet. I need to work, but I also love to work. This job has boosted my self-esteem and confidence. This is my second act. Julie, I like the idea of starting a second act at 64. Michael's supervisor and his customers give him strong feedback, and he has been recognized for taking initiative, which I think is notable as we discuss the importance of disability inclusion in the workplace. One example of how employers can foster this culture is by participating in disability-related hiring events, like OOD provides, which is a step that Michael's employer took. Now, this obviously signals that an employer is looking for diverse talent, but it may also imply an employer is making additional efforts in the workplace to foster a disability inclusive culture, which we know can help individuals with disabilities feel comfortable to disclose a disability and ask for what they need at work. Justin, you are right. Creating this culture is important because disclosing a disability can be a difficult choice for a person for a variety of reasons. Some individuals fear that disclosing a disability will impact whether they are hired or promoted, and others may feel they won't be believed if their disability is invisible. 
which can be the case with certain physical disabilities like chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and multiple sclerosis. Julie, what can employers do to help employees feel comfortable to disclose if they need an accommodation for the hiring process or at work? Dustin, a great place to start is to create a reasonable accommodation policy or set of procedures for handling requests. And then make sure to train all employees on a regular basis so they are aware of this right. It's also helpful to make it easy for applicants and employees to request an accommodation. And a great way to do this is to include a reasonable accommodation statement in key areas, <clears throat> like in job postings and job descriptions, applications, and in invitations to interviews, onboarding, and events. And then it's helpful to train supervisors on their role in the interactive process. This should address how to recognize a request because it's likely they'll be the first person the employee will ask. And then it's helpful to know what their role is in the interactive process. Sometimes a supervisor's role is to help identify a solution. So it can be very helpful to share with them some common reasonable accommodations that can be effective related to physical disabilities because this can help a supervisor to embrace the possibility of performing a work task in another way. Julie, that's a great idea, and we will share some ideas for reasonable accommodations later in the webinar. Now, we know sometimes the misconceptions people have about physical disabilities can be a barrier to employment. These can also lead to some concerns a person has about disclosing a physical disability at work. So to demystify some of these, let's review a few myths and facts about physical disabilities. How about I share the myth and then you provide the fact? Sounds good, Dustin. Okay, let's start with the idea that all physical disabilities are obvious. Dustin, we've shared in previous trainings that most disabilities are invisible. And this includes some physical conditions. A few we already mentioned, like chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and multiple sclerosis. A couple more examples include rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia. Julie, how about the myth that people with chronic fatigue just need to get more sleep at night? Actually, this condition can cause physical and mental exhaustion that cannot be overcome by a good night's sleep. Julie, the next myth is that people who use wheelchairs cannot walk. The reality here is people use wheelchairs for a variety of reasons. And so while one person may use a wheelchair because they cannot walk, Another person may use a wheelchair when they have symptoms like joint pain and fatigue that limit walking, but choose not to use a wheelchair when these symptoms lessen or subside. Julie, what about this myth? People with a spinal cord injury cannot work. Dustin, most people with a spinal cord injury return to work in some capacity within the first year of their injury, and many people return to the same job they had before the injury occurred. Julie, let's share just one more. A person who can walk does not need an accessible parking spot. Dustin, this myth taps into the concept we started with, which is not all physical disabilities are obvious or visible. With some physical conditions, a person can walk. And because they can, it may appear to others that they don't have a disability. However, a person who has a condition like multiple sclerosis may experience decreased endurance or fatigue with prolonged physical activity or experience numbness and weakness that can lead to difficulty with walking. For these reasons, accessible parking may be needed, whether it's obvious to others or not. Great. Thank you for helping us get to the truth about these misconceptions, Julie. Let's move on to some disability etiquette practices. Can you share some general guidelines relevant to interactions with anyone with a disability? Yes, Dustin, we have four simple rules to share. The first is to show respect. People with disabilities are people first. So focus on the person, not the disability. Next, be courteous. This includes respecting a person's personal space as well as the reasonable accommodations they may use to perform the job or access the workplace. Another helpful tip is don't assume. All individuals are unique with limitations and abilities. It's important to not assume what a person can or cannot do, and instead let the person decide what they can do. 
And finally, ask first. If you think someone needs assistance, don't assume you know what they need and automatically provide help. Ask the person if they need help, and if they do, ask how you can help. Julie, we also have some more specific advice when interacting with a person with a physical disability. So let's share some of these ideas. Justin, we just discussed being courteous, and additional ways we can demonstrate this is by thinking of a wheelchair or a mobility device as an extension of a person's body or their personal space. So just as you would not lean on a coworker, don't lean on a person's wheelchair, and don't place items on the wheelchair when it isn't being used. If you are having a longer conversation with a colleague who is using a wheelchair, either step back a bit or sit down so both parties can have this discussion at a respectful eye level. And one last piece of courtesy to remember, do not push someone who is using a wheelchair without asking first. Individuals use the wheelchair to move about the environment independently, and you want to be respectful of that. You wouldn't push a coworker who isn't using a wheelchair, right, Dustin? That's right. And similarly, do not grab someone who uses a cane or crutches. Also, don't move these devices without asking. It's OK to offer assistance, but don't assume the individual needs it. Now, when having conversations with colleagues, common phrases like let's walk and talk are OK to use. Dustin, it is also OK to shake a prosthetic hand. Or if a colleague is unable to shake with their right hand, shake their left hand. If a person is unable to shake hands, you could touch their arm or their shoulder when you meet them. Also, when interacting with a person who has a cosmetic disfigurement, make eye contact as you would with all your colleagues. Julie, one of my favorite pieces of advice, a person's disability or a medication they take might make it difficult for them to show enthusiasm. Yes, so don't assume someone is not interested simply because it is not obvious. Another way to be courteous, Julie, is to use plain language, I'm sorry, use language that is preferred by people with disabilities. Let's review some terms that are not considered appropriate and then their more inclusive alternatives. Dustin, we know language evolves. Terms that may have been acceptable in the past can become negative or offensive. For example, words like crippled, victim, afflicted, and confined to a wheelchair are hurtful. So it's best to avoid using these words. And instead of referring to environmental features as handicapped, like when referencing parking and entrances, use the term accessible parking or accessible entrance. Also avoid referring to people with disabilities as handicapped. Think of how you prefer people talk with you and remember to share that same respect with all people, including people with disabilities. Thank you, Julie. I think this is a good place to stop and see what questions we have and answer some questions. Um, just so that everybody knows, we did receive some questions with our registration form when people signed up for the webinar. So we'll be using some of those as we also answer questions in the Q&A box. And so, Julie, one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time for an employee who has chronic back pain and is getting older, should we start to look at a transition plan to move that individual into a less physical job? So we talked about how aging can be a cause of physical disability or a chronic condition like chronic pain. So, um, you know, these are these things can attribute to physical disability, but we don't want to make assumptions about employees in the environment that they do have a disability and they need something at work. And so the general guidance here is to focus your conversations with employees on their job performance, assess all employees the same way for the same job. And when you have conversations about low performance, listen. Sometimes if a person needs something related to a condition, they'll reveal it in those moments. So the best practice here is to let the employee ask for what they need, create that inclusive culture. And then if somebody does need something, we're going to talk here shortly about the interactive process and different examples of reasonable accommodations. So it's possible if somebody needs something, you'll find a solution and they'll be able to remain in the same job that they have. Um, when that's not possible, would you look at an alternative job? Maybe, but that's really a case by case situation. Great, thank you. Another question that we have, um, someone asked about the etiquette when walking into the building at the same time as a person who uses a wheelchair and what, like the etiquette surrounding pushing the accessibility button. 
So I have two answers answers for this. Think about this happens all the time, right? We're entering work and our colleagues are coming to work too. So there are times that someone may hold the door open for you or you may hold the door open for a colleague. So I would say my first answer to this is to offer that same courtesy to all colleagues. So if a colleague who uses a wheelchair is approaching behind you, hold the door open as you would for anyone or, or push the button. Um, we also just talked about etiquette where you ask first. Don't assume somebody needs you to push the button or that they need you to open the door. So you also could feel comfortable just to ask, can I help with getting the button or the door? The person will know if they need help and they'll they'll know how to instruct you on how to help them. So that's how I would approach that. Great, thank you, Julie. And thank you for all those great questions. We'll be stopping once more before we conclude. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the next break. Okay, Julie, I have another story for us. This one is about Tiara and was featured in the OOD Works newsletter on January 24th, 2020. Tiara has neuromyelitis optica, which affects her ability to walk. From a young age, Tiara wanted to be a cosmetologist, and in 2017, she obtained her cosmetology license. Justin, Tiara's counselor connected her with an ergonomist engineer who helped her find a wheelchair that transitioned from sitting to standing. This made it possible for Tiara to navigate around her clients. Julie Tiara found a job working for Alta Beauty in Cincinnati, Ohio. Alta installed an electric height adjustable chair to also accommodate Tiara. Her story has been featured in BuzzFeed, Yahoo Lifestyle, and shared by celebrities. Tiara said, I am happy I still get to do what I love and it has given me a part of my life back. Justin, it sounds like Tiara really has a passion for working as a cosmetologist. And this is a great example of how a reasonable accommodation, like an electric height adjustable chair, provides a way to perform the job just as effectively in another way. Julie, I thought Tiara's story might be helpful as we discuss reasonable accommodations in the interactive process. Absolutely. As a review, a reasonable accommodation is a change in the way something is customarily done to enable an individual with a disability to access the hiring process, perform the job's essential functions, and or enjoy the privileges of employment. And the interactive process is the term from the ADA that describes the collaborative process the employer engages in with the individual making the request to work together to identify and implement an effective solution. Now, as a reminder, not everyone with a physical disability needs an accommodation to be successful at work. And Julie, we know from a study from Jan that most reasonable accommodations cost nothing at all, and those with a cost are typically $500. When an accommodation will help an employee to be successful at work, the process usually begins with a request from the employee with the disability. Justin, that's correct. And this request can be made at any point during the hiring process or employment. To make a request, an individual just needs to communicate the need for a work-related change that is related to a medical condition or a disability. According to the guidance from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, a request can also come from someone other than the individual, like a family member or medical provider. An individual can ask for an accommodation using their preferred form of communication, like a phone call, an in-person conversation, or through an email. Also, the request can use plain language, which means the individual does not have to reference the Americans with Disabilities Act or use the term reasonable accommodation. Julie, do you have any examples? Yes, I have three examples from the EEOC. In the first, an employee tells his supervisor he needs six weeks off work to receive treatment for a back problem. This is a request for a reasonable accommodation. In the second example, a new employee tells her supervisor her wheelchair does not fit under the desk in her office. This is a request for a reasonable accommodation. In the next example, an employee who has been off work for six months because of a worker's compensation injury provides his employer with a letter from his treating doctor stating he can return to work in a light duty position with specific physical restrictions. This letter is a request for a reasonable accommodation. 
Julie, can you review when an employer can ask an employee with a disability if an accommodation is needed? Sure, the EEOC guidance says an employer may ask an individual if they need an accommodation when they know the employee has a disability and they can reasonably believe the employee may need a reasonable accommodation. An example from the EEOC describes a scenario where an employer is scheduling a work lunch at a restaurant and is not sure what questions to ask to make sure the restaurant is accessible for an employee who uses a wheelchair. The guidance states the employer may ask the employee first. Now, Julie, let's move on to the interactive process. As we said, a request for an accommodation usually begins this process. Now, Tiara's physical disability is fairly apparent since she uses a wheelchair, but some physical disabilities are invisible. Is this when an employer can request documentation of the disability? Yes, that is one example. So when an employer begins the interactive process, they are allowed to know a person has a disability. In general, an employer can request documentation to verify the person has a disability when it is not obvious. For example, it may not be obvious that an individual has a disability due to having chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. But when it is obvious, the employer cannot ask for documentation to verify the disability. Now, whether the disability is obvious or not, an employer can request documentation to verify the need for the accommodation if the need itself is not obvious. For example, let's say an employee who has muscular dystrophy and uses a wheelchair requests dictation software to input information into the computer. The employer knows the employee has a disability, but it may not be obvious why a person who uses a wheelchair is requesting dictation software. In a case like this, the employer may consider asking the employee for documentation that describes the disability impairment in terms of the nature, severity, and duration, describes the activity or activities the disability impairment limits, and the extent to which the disability impairment limits the employee's ability to perform a job or job tasks. It can be helpful for employers to have a standard form employees can give their medical providers. This can help medical providers understand what information employers need related to performing the job. We have an example from Jan in the learner's guide of a medical inquiry form, which may be helpful for employers to review. So Julie, we often share that the ADA does not provide a list of conditions that automatically qualify a person as having a disability, but the ADA does have a list of conditions that should be easily concluded to be a disability. I imagine some physical conditions are included on that list. Justin, that's correct. So let's first discuss the ADA's definition of disability. The ADA defines disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. A major life activity is a daily function that is important to most people and that most people in the general population can perform with little or no difficulty. These are functions like we've talked about earlier, walking and standing, lifting, carrying, performing manual tasks, reaching and bending, and many others. Major life activities also include major bodily functions, like the functions of the musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, neurological, and respiratory systems. How an individual's physical disability impacts major life activities and major bodily functions will be unique to each person. The ADA does have a non-exhaustive list of conditions that should easily be concluded to be a disability. And some examples from that list related to physical disabilities include partially or completely missing limbs, mobility impairments, multiple sclerosis, and muscular dystrophy. So Dustin, this is helpful for employers to be aware of when deciding whether to obtain documentation. I agree. Now, after the employer has verified the disability and the need for accommodation, they begin to identify potential accommodations by collaborating with the employee. Earlier, you mentioned physical disabilities can impact gross motor function, fine motor function, and other motor functions. Where do you recommend employers begin? 
Justin, a great way to start this process is to ask the employee what they think would be an effective solution because he or she likely knows what will work best. The employer could also consult with the supervisor to better understand the job's essential functions and to find out if there are any performance issues. Sometimes low performance may reveal where a barrier is present in performing a task, which can lead to an idea for an accommodation. It's also helpful to be aware of the limitations an employee with a physical disability may experience at work, like with walking and standing, bending and reaching and carrying, or with activities like sitting, grasping, and handling items. Or an employee could be impacted by pain, endurance, decreased coordination, or difficulty with balance. Mostly, it's important to remember that all employees are unique, including employees with disabilities, so what is needed will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Julie, it can also be helpful for employers to be familiar with the types of reasonable accommodations available so they have more ideas to consider in the process. Now, Tiara's adjustable chair would be an example of her employer providing equipment. What are some other types of accommodations that might be used by a person with a physical disability? Justin, there are several types of accommodations employers can consider, like making the work environment accessible, restructuring a job, permitting a flexible schedule, providing or altering equipment and services, altering supervisory methods, modifying policies, and providing reassignment. We are going to highlight examples of some of these types of reasonable accommodations related to physical disabilities. Julie, since I mentioned providing equipment and services, let's start there. Sure. There are many examples of equipment that can be used as a reasonable accommodation. I worked with a gentleman who had a chronic back condition who worked as a mechanic, and we implemented a tire lift on wheels that he used to transport the tire from the storage area to the bay where the car was positioned on a lift. The tire lift had the ability to raise the tire to the proper height so he could maneuver the tire from the lift to install on the car. Another example is providing speech recognition software for an employee who has limitations using her hands and fingers so she can input information into documents through dictation instead of with using a keyboard and mouse. And an example of a service that can be used as a reasonable accommodation is to provide a driver or transportation service for an employee whose disability limits driving. This service could enable the employee to perform an essential function of the job, like traveling in the community to meet with clients. Okay, Julie, what are some ways that an employer can make the work environment accessible for a person with a physical disability? One example I have is of an applicant who uses a wheelchair and requests an accommodation for the interview because the interview is scheduled to take place on the third floor of an office building that does not have an elevator. As a reasonable accommodation, the employer relocated the interview to an accessible office on the first floor. Another example is an employee who has multiple sclerosis, which impacts her endurance for walking long distances. One idea to consider is to provide the employee with a designated workstation that is close to the main entrance and common areas to minimize the distance she needs to walk while at work. Julie, how can an employer restructure a job as an accommodation? Restructuring the job means the employer is identifying another way to perform the job's essential functions or considering whether the marginal functions can be removed or traded with a coworker. Let's say an employee's physical disability limits their endurance. One idea an employer could consider is to permit the employee to perform the more strenuous essential functions of the job when their energy levels are at their best. I have an example from the EEOC of exchanging the marginal functions of the job between coworkers. In this example, a member of a cleaning crew wears a prosthetic leg, which limits his ability to climb steps. This limitation makes it difficult for him to perform the job's marginal function of sweeping the steps throughout the building. Another crew member is assigned the marginal function of cleaning the break room. This crew member can sweep the steps and the first crew member can clean the break room. So Dustin, as a reasonable accommodation, the employer swapped the marginal functions of these two employees. What about permitting a flexible schedule? 
Justin, this can be a simple and no cost reasonable accommodation for employers to consider. Like we said earlier, some conditions have exacerbations or flare ups that need to be managed. So an employee may need a flexible schedule that permits them to leave work early two days a week for a period of time to attend physical therapy sessions. With a flexible schedule, this could be provided by shortening lunch on those days. Another example is of an employee who uses public transportation for their commute to work because their disability limits driving. Sometimes public transportation gets off schedule and causes a person to be late or the regular schedule does not coincide with the employee's start time. So in this situation, an employer could consider a flexible start time. So the employee is not disciplined for being tardy when the bus is late or is permitted to start their day later on a regular basis due to the bus's schedule. That's a good point, Julie. Some of the articles about Tiara mentioned that she needed a new van for her wheelchair. She may have had to use public transportation to get to work before getting the van. This could have been a good accommodation solution for her. What kinds of policies could an employer consider altering as a form of reasonable accommodation? Justin, I have a few ideas for this category, but first I want to remind employers that just because a rule is a part of a policy, it doesn't mean that rule can't be modified to enable an employee with a disability to perform the job. <clears throat> for example, an employer may have a no animal policy and as a reasonable accommodation and an employer may need to consider modifying this policy to permit an employee with a physical disability to utilize their service animal in the workplace. The employee may need the animal to assist with functions like balance, walking, and transporting items. Another example could be to modify a hybrid workplace policy to permit an employee with a disability to temporarily telework full time while their wheelchair is being repaired or while their service animal is being trained. And one last example goes along with another accommodation we discussed, which is permitting a flexible schedule. Allowing this reasonable accommodation may require a modification to an attendance policy. Okay, Julie, I have another story for us. This one is about Jennifer and was featured in an OOD Works newsletter on May 1st, 2020. Jennifer has cerebral palsy. After an internship in communications, she was hired as a receptionist at Pleasant View Care Center in Parma, Ohio. There, she sorts mail, answers the phone, enters data, and completes other office duties. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Jennifer helped screen guests to the facility in order to keep the residents safe. Justin, Jennifer said she felt lucky to be working at a time when others were losing their jobs. She said she enjoys communicating with the residents, providing help, and encouraging family members. Jennifer also said her disability helps her connect with residents. I know what it feels like to navigate the world with physical challenges, as many of our residents do, she stated. Now, Julie, the article does not specify any accommodations Jennifer uses, but it does say OOD provided her with some assistive technology. So it's possible she uses an accommodation at work. We often discuss the importance of confidentiality with reasonable accommodations. Do you wanna share some reminders about confidentiality when it comes to these accommodations? Justin, the EEOC provides criteria for how to handle the personal and medical information an employer obtains when an individual discloses a disability and requests a reasonable accommodation. Their guidance states that this information should be kept in separate medical files that are stored apart from general personnel files, whether they are stored electronically or in physical filing cabinets. Now, there are times that certain information can be shared with designated parties. For example, Employees who facilitate accommodations may need to know certain information to implement the accommodation successfully, but they're not permitted to know unnecessary details about the disability, medical condition, or related limitations. These may be employees who work in facilities or IT or who help during emergency situations. The same is true for supervisors. A supervisor often needs to know about an accommodation so they can help facilitate this or sometimes they simply just need to be aware of the accommodation. For example, we talked earlier about when an employee may need to telework temporarily while their wheelchair is being repaired. 
The supervisor would need to know this accommodation has been implemented so they don't expect the employee to be on site working during that period of time. But like the other example, they are not permitted to know detailed information about the employee's disability. In these examples, if there is a reason information related to the disability, beyond just the fact that an accommodation is being provided is necessary for these parties and their role in the process, the employee receiving the accommodation should be informed first to make sure they're okay with this disclosure. Julie, we know employers and supervisors get questions from other employees when they notice an accommodation a coworker is receiving. How should they respond to these questions? Nustin, you're right. Now, when an employee has an obvious disability, coworkers may be less inclined to ask questions about the accommodations they see because the need for the accommodation may also be obvious. But as we said, some physical disabilities are invisible. So when a coworker sees an accommodation and it's not obvious why their colleague is receiving it, they may ask a question simply because they want this too, like a flexible schedule or to have an adjustable height workstation. So it's best to be prepared to respond in a way that protects the confidentiality of the employee receiving the accommodation. We know the employer cannot respond by saying the individual has a disability. But the employer also cannot say that the employee is receiving a reasonable accommodation because that term is unique to the ADA and it automatically discloses a person has a disability. Informing supervisors and the employees who implement reasonable accommodations of how you would like them to respond helps them to be prepared to respond appropriately. The EEOC offers ideas for employers to consider. One idea is to emphasize that the employer's policy is to assist any employee who encounters difficulty at work and to then explain these kinds of situations are personal and inform the employee that they are required to follow confidentiality guidelines. The EEOC also recommends reassuring the employee who is asking the question that his or her privacy would be respected in a similar situation. A great way to prevent these types of questions is to train all employees on the right to reasonable accommodation. Dustin, employers often provide this for new employees during onboarding and on a regular basis for all employees. Okay, let's go back to Jennifer. She works in an environment where I'm sure safety is a priority, not only for the employees, but also for the residents of the center. We know at times fears and misconceptions can lead employers to think a person with a disability cannot safely perform certain tasks. As we move into the final portion of today's webinar, let's talk about how an employer handles situations involving safety, conduct, and performance when disability is involved. Sure, Dustin. I'll start with safety. The EEOC addresses this through their guidance on direct threat which states that employers are permitted to establish qualification standards that employees not pose a direct threat in the workplace. And they define this as a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of the individual or others that cannot be reduced by reasonable accommodation. The EEOC guidance states an employer can ask an individual about their disability when they have a reasonable belief based on objective evidence that the employee may not be able to perform the job safely due to their disability. What's most important to know is that if an employer thinks a direct threat may exist, they must use the criteria that EEOC provides to assess the situation, which includes assessing the individual's knowledge, skills, experience, and ability to safely do the job. It also includes identifying the specific risk showing the risk is current and not speculative or remote. It includes performing an assessment based on objective evidence and determining if the risk can be eliminated or reduced through a reasonable accommodation. An example from the EEOC says, an employer cannot assume that a person with cerebral palsy who has restricted manual dexterity cannot work in a laboratory because she will pose a risk of breaking glass containers filled with dangerous contents. The employer must apply the criteria and evaluate the abilities and limitations of the employee to make the determination of whether a direct threat exists. And remember, when this assessment reveals a direct threat, the next step is to consider whether a reasonable accommodation is available to eliminate or reduce the risk to an acceptable level.
Julie, employers often ask us questions about reasonable accommodations related to conduct and performance. So let's start with conduct. Justin, based on the guidance from the EEOC about conduct and disability, employers can generally expect all employees, including employees with disabilities, to meet their conduct standards. If an employee with a disability violates a conduct rule and disability is not a contributing factor, the employer can apply the same consequences it would apply to any employee who broke the same rule. Now, when an employee responds to discipline for misconduct by disclosing a disability and requests a reasonable accommodation, the employer should begin the interactive process just as they would with any request they receive. And the employer may apply the consequences for the misconduct as long as the conduct rule is job related and consistent with business necessity and is equally applied to all employees. Julie, what are some best practices for employers when it comes to managing performance with employees with disabilities? Justin, what I'd like to discuss first is that Title I of the ADA states that individuals with disabilities must be qualified to perform the job's essential functions with or without reasonable accommodation. So employers can expect all employees to be qualified to do the job. Some employees may use a reasonable accommodation to do this. And the point of the accommodation is to enable the person to perform the job to the expected productivity and quality standards all employees are held to. These standards are managed by employers to ensure employees are meeting their goals. So an employer would generally assess all employees the same way to determine whether they are meeting these expectations. There are times when low performance is an employee's first indication to themselves that their disability is contributing to their work. And it can be common then for an employee to disclose a disability and request a reasonable accommodation. So if this occurs, the employer should begin the interactive process as they would with any request they receive. Julie, what if the employer suspects the employee's disability might be impacting performance? Low performance is often unrelated to disability. However, an employer may ask an employee if their low performance is related to their disability when all three of these circumstances are true. First, the employer knows the employee has a disability. Second, the employer has observed the employee's low performance or has reliable information from someone else. And third, the employer reasonably believes the disability is contributing to the low performance. The best practice in this situation is to begin with discussing with the employee the performance problem, the job's expectations, and asking what you can do to help them meet these goals. For example, an employee who works as an administrative assistant has previously disclosed to her employer that she has arthritis in her hands. Her manager notices a pattern that the notes the employee is taking during meetings are missing important content. The manager also notices the employee frequently lays her pen down and rubs her hands while taking notes. The manager discusses the performance concerns with the employee and asks how she can help. The employee discloses that writing for long periods causes significant pain and makes it difficult to hold the pen to take notes. The employer begins the interactive process and she and the employee determine an effective reasonable accommodation is to use a smart pen during meetings to record notes, which can be transcribed and shared later. Keeping the conversation focused on the job instead of the disability is the best way to start. So thank you, Julie. OK, let's take one more break to see what questions we have. Um, a question that's in the Q&A box, Julie. What if employers do not provide the accommodations? What if the employers say that the employee is unable to then complete the essential functions of the job? So when you're in the interactive process, this is a collaborative effort between the employee who's asking for the accommodation and the employer to identify an effective solution. And so, uh, you know, there's not enough detail for me to necessarily know what's going on here, but what should be happening in the interactive process is you're um, taking a look at the job's essential functions. If there's any performance issues, kind of reviewing um, that and see if you can find any barriers that might be present that's causing the low performance and then collaborating together to come up with ideas and those accommodations um, are intended to enable the person to perform the job's essential functions 
And so once you've identified those solutions, um, the employer is permitted to select the effective accommodation that they they prefer. Um, if it's determined that there is not an effective reasonable accommodation that's reasonable, maybe everything we have found, the employer has applied the criteria and determined it's an undue hardship, then the next step would be to consider other options or look at reassigning um, the employee to a vacant but equitable position. Thank you, Julie. Um, OK, so another question that we have that was pre-submitted, due to the era of COVID, an employer has some remote jobs. However, a specific job was not planned to ever be a remote position. It is possible for a well-trained person to work remotely, but it is not optimal or planned. The department is only two people. Must an employer accommodate a new hire to the department who is not fully trained with remote working? The new hire uh, revealed that they are pregnant and wants, reason, wants remote accommodations. So Dustin, I'm going to answer the, the part of this question that's referencing pregnancy first. So according to the ADA, pregnancy itself is not a disability. And so being pregnant does not qualify a person for protection under the ADA for a reasonable accommodation. Now there are times that being pregnant can then result in a condition like gestational diabetes that might rise to the level of a disability under the ADA. And then in that case, provide the person with protection under the ADA to request a reasonable accommodation. So with that, um, I think there's just more information that might need to be um, determined. Um, there is a Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and sometimes what might be needed could um, be provided through the Family and Medical Leave Act. So the employer will wanna look at the whole picture and see which, um, which of those apply here if any, and then move forward. As far as looking at telework as a reasonable accommodation, telework has always been a type of an accommodation an employer could consider, uh, whether you have a policy or not. You go through the same steps when you're evaluating that request that you do any request for an accommodation. So you look at, um, can the essential functions of the job be performed in the remote environment? Can the employee be effectively supervised in their remote environment as all employees are supervised? Um, does the employee need access to certain tools or supplies or equipment or even documentation that is only available on site? So you look at all of these factors to determine whether the request for telework is effective and reasonable for the employer. Um, so it's just like any other accommodation. What I would like to point out about this is sometimes we think of telework as all or nothing, but it could be um, a hybrid type of situation where those tasks that can be performed effectively at home are permitted to be. And for those tasks that have to be performed on site, then that's when the person comes into the office. And so there's a lot of ways to look at this, but really we go through that process. It's not based on you know, do we have a policy? Do we permit new employees to work at home? Um, you know, you look more at is it effective to train the person, do the job, and supervise the employee in the remote environment? And you are, as an employer, permitted to look at effective solutions in the office as well. Great, thank you. Another uh, question that's in the, the Q&A box. Are we required to accommodate a person who needs prescribed narcotic painkillers or medical marijuana? So you would go through the interactive process as you would with any request you receive. And if the disability is not obvious, then you are permitted to um, ask the employee for documentation to verify the disability and the need for um, the accommodation. So my answer to that is if a person has a disability that qualifies under the ADA, then you would go through the interactive process to identify what accommodation um, ideas are available that are effective and, and, and choose between the two of you which one to implement. All right, let's I think we have time for one more question. So when a request is made for a service animal, do you have suggestions of ways to honor the request, but also take into account potential challenges for coworkers, such as allergies or fears they might have? Yes, so this is a common question that what if we receive a request for a service animal and determine that's what this employee needs and that's effective, but having the animal in the environment might um, 
be a concern for other employees who have fears or allergies. And so the answer is you you move forward with both um, both requests. So the individual asking to use the service animal, go through the interactive process. A best practice if you're going to implement that then is to notify all employees that an animal will be present in the work environment. Certainly don't reveal any confidential information about the person, the disability, or the need for the accommodation, um, and maybe share some best practices. We know don't pet the service animal, don't distract the service animal, but in that general announcement, then if a person comes forward saying, I have an allergy, I have a fear, there are some ideas that you can consider. Um, the most common consideration is putting distance between these two employees if possible. If they have to work together in meetings, consider using um, what a lot of us are using now, which are virtual meetings. There's other ways that we can meet besides in person. Um, if it's related to an allergy, you can look at increased cleaning. You could look at using air purifiers. And so there are certainly ways to consider how to accommodate both employees in this situation. Great. I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for those great questions. Now, Julie, I have one last story for us today. It's about Mariah, who is actually a former college to career student. This story was featured in the OOD Works newsletter on August 6th, 2021. Mariah has physical disabilities that limit her energy and her mobility. She graduated from Miami University in 2020 and began looking for a job. She participated in an OOD work from home hiring event in February 2021, where she had the opportunity to speak with Huntington Bank. Shortly after the event, Huntington hired Mariah in a remote position as a credit services specialist. The ability to work from home suits Mariah's needs. She said that she finds working to be very fulfilling. So Julie, would you like to summarize our discussion today? Yes, thank you, Dustin. Mariah's story highlights some of the best practices we talked about today. We discussed the importance of creating a culture of disability inclusion, and one way many employers do this is by recruiting talent from hiring events that include qualified candidates with disabilities, like how Huntington found Mariah by participating in an OOD hiring event. And Tiara's story demonstrates how identifying and implementing an effective reasonable accommodation can enable an individual with a disability to perform the job just as effectively in another way when it's needed. The accommodation she is using is an electric height adjustable chair. So hopefully the stories we've shared today, along with the best practices and examples, help employers feel more prepared when they are navigating the reasonable accommodation process with individuals with a physical disability. We appreciate you being here today, so thank you all for your interest. And Dustin, it's always a joy to co-host with you. Thank you.